web of life we live I will give you everything you give to everyone and all we give to one another so that all of us might live the circle ends where it begins and starts again just where it ends no seam no separation and no finish line to pass there is no need for hurry and no use for fear and worry for our lives roll on forever but only this one moment lasts center you are in with everything you know and everything you try to understand i will love you always and forever as you love the one who's everything and nothing you once dreamed of hand in hand the circle ends where it begins and starts again just where it ends no seam no separation and no finish line to pass there is no need for hurry and no use for fear and worry for our lives roll on forever but only this one moment lasts
Good morning, y'all. I am Reverend Amy Carol Webb. My pronouns are she, her, and they. And I'm just so happy to see you this morning. Welcome to our first River of Grass Unitarian Universalist Congregation's fully online service. In this season of sequestering, as we do our part to keep ourselves and one another safe in this congregation, where our mission is to nurture our spirits, to love intentionally and to create a just and healthy planet. It is our enduring search for truth and meaning that draws us together, not a creed. What we share here is not unchanging dogma, but an affirmation that we are called to be agents of love and justice and to build a world where everyone is cherished for who they are. We believe to the depths of our souls that this mission before us is not changed in this time the world seems to have tilted on its axis and nothing feels normal. In fact, we believe that we are called all the more, that even while we maintain physical distance, we still sustain our spiritual connections by whatever means available and grow in unity and in love. So we find ourselves here this morning in a Zoom room rather than in our precious sanctuary. In a little while, I'll see all of you in little boxes, as I'm seeing some of you now. Little boxes that may have your face or your family or your home or your woods behind you, but they cannot contain your heart. It's so good just to see one another. It's been a long couple of weeks since we all gathered with our eyes on one another and on the horizon of our adventures as a liberal religious community. And now our, our signposts, our markers, our landmarks, our touchstones have suddenly changed. And we don't know when those will come back in our sight. But this we know. We are still here. We are still ourselves, our lives still have meaning, maybe even more meaning than we knew because we can't take anything for granted now. And one of the hard lessons we're learning is how much we take for granted. The truth is yet being revealed. Our responsibility to this faith, to the divine by every name, to the hope we claim, to the love that leads us, all that has called us together this morning, these have not changed. How we live this truth, this faith, this love is already finding new ways to transform our lives. Just look at you. How many of you ever thought you'd be driven enough by this need to connect and to reach for one another in everything that matters? How many of you ever thought you would be driven by that so much so that you would learn to use a device? <laughs> How many of you have had a steep learning curve this week? just to be able to reach back to all of us who love you and you whom you love. Compelled by our need for kindness and grace and compassion for a moment to touch the things that are most real within us and between us, even virtually. You are miracles. I hope you know that. You are champions. You are treasure. If you're already a member among us, we rejoice that you have made your home with us. If you're a friend, we hope you'll find your home with us. If you're a visitor, we invite you to feel at home with us. However we made our way together this morning, we welcome one another as we are, where we are, who we are, in this great unknown that we are actually built for because of the bonds we've already made. If you come with a hungry heart, we hope to help nourish you. If you come with a hopeful heart, we too are hopeful despite it all. If you come with a hurting heart, we hope to comfort you. If you come with a joyful heart, we rejoice with you. If you come searching, we too are searching. However you are, whoever you are, we promise to meet you as you are and never leave you behind. This morning's service was slated to be our annual poetry service, 
centered on poems of comfort and courage and led by Zena. We decided to keep it that way because there's so much solace in the words and the meanings and the voices and faces of those who you'll see in a few moments bringing poems that matter to share with us. We need this more than ever right now. So have you noticed that I have not called this virtual worship? Because it's not. The medium may be virtual, but our feelings, our connections, our lifting up of all that is worthy in our lives by whatever names have meaning for us, this is real. Now that we have gathered, let us enter into our sacred time together. covenant. Love is the spirit of this congregation and service is its law. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta congregación. El servicio su ley principal. Esta es nuestra gran promesa. Vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad a través del amor y ayudarnos mutuamente.
Today, we dare to reveal some of our inner truths about ourselves, ideas of what we think is important, what is true and meaningful, what be better way to express our thoughts on abundance than in a poem. This service is dedicated to our third Unitarian Universalist principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. I hope you enjoy this deep sharing time. I am Beth Kaufman. I'm going to read a poem by my mother, Mary Alice Kaufman. She was both a prolific poet and a devout atheist. And out of that came a series of poems she called The Iconoclast. This poem, Pray Let Us Eat, is her sarcastic views on Thanksgiving dinner. Bow your heads above your dinners, men and women, saints and sinners. On this food, O Lord, a blessing, meat and dumplings, peas and dressing. Look not on our adipose, but bless, we pray, this overdose of calories propitiary, may we use them to thy glory. Gravy, yams, and succotash, by, for which we paid out good cold cash, bless, O Lord, our mastication. Receive in turn our adulation for giving us more than we need while turning deaf when others plead for bread to see them through the day. To you, O Lord, they daily pray. Yea, Lord, they are all are thine creation. It's just that we have a concentration of your love and of your pleasure, brimming over with good measure, by which we are assured, dear Lord, you do approve our groaning board. My name is Rita Cherubini, and I'm going to be reading a poem by Rita Dove. She's an award-winning poet and author, and the second Afri African-American to receive the Pulitzer Prize. From 1993 to 1995, she was the U.S. Poet Laureate. This is the name of her second book called Yellow House on the Corner. Shape the lips to an O, say A. That's island. One word of Swedish has changed the whole neighborhood. When I look up, the yellow house on the corner is a galleon stranded in flowers. Around it, the wind, even the high roar of a leaf mulcher could be the horn blast from a ship as it skirts the misted shoals. We don't need much more to keep things going. Families complete themselves and refuse to budge from the present. The present extends its glass forehead to the sea. Backyard breezes, scattered cardinals. And if one evening the house on the corner took off over the marshland, Neither I nor my neighbor would be amazed. Sometimes a word is found so right it trembles at the slightest explanation. You start out with one thing and end up with another. Nothing's like it used to be, not even the future. Welcome to my home. Recording from my yeah, dining area. I'm happy to be in touch with everybody at a distance and sharing um, a poem that I wrote about a month ago. Times are rather different then. It's called Abundance. Waters of joy bubble up. I cannot contain the myriad drops pressed to expand. I must rise to the call, a universal force larger than myself invites me to re-enter life, dance a Zumba rhythm, rich, full, and colorful, purple, red, and orange hues burst out in all directions up and down, inside and out, reverberations without limit, like shooting stars in a clear night sky, nature's fireworks display, unplanned and unexpected, and I, 
a cracked and well-worn vessel, both witness and container for this celebration. Bow down and kiss the earth in gratitude. This is an excerpt from Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ulysses. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark broad seas, my mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads, you and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done. Not unbecoming men that strove with gods, the light begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world, push off, and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset, the baths of all the western seas until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall watch the happy isles and see the great Achilles, whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive to seek, to find, and not to yield. Hi, I'm Susan Moss, and I've been a follower of Joy Harjo's poetry for decades. Uh, she was named U.S. Poet Laureate in June of 2019, and I had the joy and honor of seeing and hearing her at the Miami Book Fair this past November. Um, I know that the topic of this poetry service is abundance, but little did I know way back on February 1st when I submitted this poem for inclusion that how relevant it would be. The title is Perhaps the World Ends Here by Joy Harjo. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. I'm Diane Diaz, and I love apples. I'm going to read a story that deals with abundance. Hey, this month's theme, and it's called Johnny Appleseed. Well, Jonathan Chapman was a real man, but he 
He did such amazing things in this country, oh, about 200 years ago, that everybody started to talk about him and remember him, and he became a legend. And that's why we call him Johnny Appleseed. Let's see why. This poem was written by Rosemary and Stephen Benet, one of the finest poets of the 20th century. Of Jonathan Chapman, two things are known, that he loved apples, that he walked alone. At 70 odd, he was gnarled as could be, but ruddy and sound as a good apple tree. For 50 years over, he harvest and dew, he planted his apples where no apples grew. The winds of the prairie might blow through his rags, but he carried his seeds in best deer skin bags. From old Ashtabula to frontier Fort Wayne, he planted and pruned and he planted again. He had not a hat to encumber his head. He wore a tin pan on his white hair instead. He nestled with owls, with bear cub and possum, and knew all the orchards, root, tendril, and blossom. A fine old man, as ripe as a pippin, his heart still light, and his step still skipping. Stalking Indian, the beast in its lair, did no hurt while he was there, for they could tell, as all things can, that Jonathan Chapman was God's own man. Why did he do it? We do not know. He wished that apples might root and grow. He has no statue. He has no tomb. He has his apple trees still in bloom. Consider, consider, think well upon the marvelous story of Apple Seed John. Uh, my name is Valerie Lawrence Pellegrini, and uh, it's a delight to be here. This is one place that I think really defines what we mean by spirituality, a union of all. And uh, the uh, topic was abundance that was chosen for the poetry this week. And I wondered how do we define, how do we uncover and discover abundance? Is it the search for survival, or, or is it a pure energy that flows you know, through us that we call a love and a longing for love? So that's how the poem turned out. It's called The Duel of Abund Abundance. Eternal abundance at the heart of love cannot be measured as it exists forever in the soul's endeavor, the heart's treasure. But often, in the flesh's struggle for survival, abundance can become its own rival. The moral switchblade of hypocrisy in the quest for survival and security. Still, the deepest gift of abundance radiates through us all. Love, compassion, understanding, the wisdom beyond matter's walls. So let's remember, the soul's abundance is the infinite within and beyond the finite. This poem, The Lotus Eaters, is by Alfred Lord Tennyson, the 19th century English poet. He was poet laureate of England for some time. It is based on Homer's Iliad. The soldiers, are, the warriors, are on the way home when they are shipwrecked on this island of lotus eaters, the hallucinogen. And here they wish to remain because of the beauty and the ease. And here we go. There is sweet music here that softer falls and petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass. Music that gently on the spirit lies 
untired eyelids up untired eyes, music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies. Here are cool mosses deep, and through the moss the ivies creep, and in the stream the long leaf flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. Why are we weighed upon with heaviness and utterly consumed with sharp distress while all things else have rest from weariness? All things have rest. Why do we toil alone? We only toil who are the first of things and make perpetual moan still from one sorrow to another throne. Nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings nor steep to our brows in slumber's holy balm, nor hearken what the inner spirit sings. There is no joy but calm. Why should we only toil, the roof and crown of things? Lo, in the middle of the wood, the folded leaf is wood from out the bud, with winds upon the branch, and there grows green and broad, and hath no toil. Sun steeped at noon, and in the moon nightly dew fed, and the turning yellow falls and floats adown the air. Lo, sweetened with the summer light, the full juiced apple, waxing over mellow, drops in a silent autumn night. All its allotted length of days, the flower ripens in its place, ripens and fades and falls, and hath no toil, fast rooted in the fruitful soil. Hateful is the dark blue sky vaulted over the dark blue sea. Death is the end of life. Ah, uh, why should life or labor be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast, and in a little while oral dips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us, and become portions and parts of a dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? All things have rest and ripen towards the grave in, in silence, ripen, fall, and cease. Give us long rest or death, dark death or dreamful ease. I'm going to read An April Day by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. When the warm sun that brings seed time and harvest has returned again, tis sweet to visit the still wood where springs the first flower of the plain. I love the season well when forest glades are teeming with bright forms, nor dark and many folded clouds foretell the coming on of storms. From the earth's loosened mold, the sapling draws its sustenance and thrives. Though stricken to the heart with winter's cold, the drooping tree revives. The softly warbled song comes from the pleasant woods and colored wings glance quick in the bright sun that moves along the forest openings. When the bright sunset fills the silver woods with light, the green slope throws its shadows in the hollows of the hills and wide the upland glows. And when the eve is born in the blue lake, the sky or reaching far is hollowed out and the moon dips her horn and twinkles many a star. Inverted in the tide, stand the gray rocks and trembling shadows throw and the fair trees look over side by side and see themselves below sweet april many a thought is wedded unto thee as hearts are wed nor shall they fail till to its autumn brought life's golden fruit is shed Hey everybody, um, I'm going to read this morning the poem Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. 
I haven't practiced very much. This is kind of last minute. So thanks for your patience. Um, and here we go. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and send you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Beneath the Sweater and the Skin by Jeanette Insinius and de dedicated to my wife, Deb. How many years of beauty do I have left? She asks me. How many more do you want? Here, here's 34, here's 50. When you're 80 years old and your beauty rises in ways your cells cannot even imagine now, and your wild bones grow luminous and ripe, having carried the weight of a passionate life. When your hair is aflame with winter, and you have decades of learning and leaving and loving sewn into the corners of your eyes, and your children come home to find their own history in your face. When you know what it feels like to fail ferociously and have gained the capacity to rise and rise and rise again, when you can make your tea on a quiet and ridiculously lonely afternoon and still have a song in your heart, queen owls, owl wings beating beneath the cotton of your sweater, because your beauty began there beneath the sweater and the skin, remember? This is when I will take you into my arms and coo, you brave and glorious thing, you've come so far, I see you. Your beauty is breathtaking. Hi, my name is Zena Tucker, and I'm reading a, a poem from the West Indies. It's by Roger My Mace, and it's very brief, so don't close your eyes. But do close your eyes, because you have to imagine this poem while I read it. It's called Children Coming from School. I can hear the gospel of little feet go, choiring down the dusty asphalt street, beneath the vast cathedral of sky, with the sun for steeple, evangeling with laughter, go the shining ones, the little people.
Thank you for all that poetry, all those readers, all that timelessness of a message that we need so right now. At least I do. And I have a feeling that whatever any of us is feeling we need right now, we can be assured that the others among us that we are connected to and those we're just getting to know, we're all feeling these things. Nobody knows how to do this. If you've been having moments this week when you doubted yourself and you didn't know if you were doing it right, you were doing it right because you were doing something. We don't know how to do this. We're going to have to help one another, whatever comes next, and know that the foundations we have built are strong and will hold us in relationship as we figure out how we take our next steps and move through the world in whatever ways that we can. In our community each week, we light candles for those things that are on our hearts to share with our community. We're going to take some time now to consider those things amongst us, those things that you may want to share in this group. Hold on a second, I'm opening my screen a little bit so I can see more and see more of you. There we go, that's better. Okay. So I want you to think for a moment. In the midst of all that's changed and it seems some days like absolutely everything has changed and then I look out the window or I sit on my porch and the cat jumps in my lap and the dog curls up next to me and it feels normal for a moment and it's been such beautiful days you can look outside and think oh everything's just fine and then we realize that something else is going on in parallel so things are all fine and they're also not all fine and this dichotomy this paradox is hard to hold that's one of the reasons we're here for one another is to help hold that paradox in 
in ways that sustain us and carry us forward. So in the face of all that's changed and continues to change, every few minutes some days, what are the things that have not? What are the things that have not changed in your life? What are the things that hold? William Butler Yeats said, the center cannot hold. Yes, the center does hold. So what is it, what is it holding for you? Maybe it is just the way your orchids bloom, or maybe it is being able to see your grandchild on, on the screen. Maybe it is figuring out ways to be together in physical distance, but spiritual proximity. What are the ways that have held for you? What, what about your love? Maybe that's even more intense right now because we don't get to just casually celebrate that. Maybe it's the art that's coming up in you. Maybe it's your love for this congregation. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, laughing as I did this week that we've been so, so concerned for so long about running out of room in our building in River of Grass. Now we're out of that building and we have all the room in the world to gather in this way. We're not constrained by space anymore. Now here we are on Zoom and we can have all the rooms we really need to continue this good work that we started and to deepen our connections in new ways. I don't know about you, but there are people that I just count on seeing on Sunday and checking in with and knowing that we weren't physically going to be together made me crave their contact. And I hope that with us, when we have that craving, we make the call, we send the text, even just to say, hey, you crossed my mind and I wanted to let you know. So think about these things that haven't changed and also hold the things that have because we know there's grief in there. And all change is grief, even when it's good change. All change is grief because it's, cha it's change. And if you've been feeling that, that's okay. That's part of this. So let's take a moment and hold the things that have not changed and sustain us while we also hold the things that have changed and that we need to look at in a different way and sometimes just let go because we don't know what comes next. Let's just take a minute, feel it in our bodies, feel it in our, in our cells, feel it in our hearts, feel it in our minds. Let's just feel it together for a moment. William Butler, Butler, I'm sorry, <laughs> William James wrote that we are like islands in the sea, separate on the surface, but connected in the deep. Wow, that means something new now. Because now we're keeping physical distance, but reaching ever more deliberately to strengthen our spiritual connections. We're connected in ways we didn't even realize. I would like to invite you to put some things in chat that you would like to have lifted up in this community. We'll, we'll verbalize as many as we can, and then we will be carrying on in our hospitality time in ways that, ways we can chat together. Ken and Leanna say, grateful that uh, Ken says, my 95-year-old mom is safe in her apartment in Colorado, and she has mastered FaceTime. So we've been in more closer contact than before the crisis. And he says, thank you all for the presence we're bringing. Jeannie says, loving my little dogs are always unaware of the craziness. Mandy asks that we keep all of the healthcare professionals in our prayers and thoughts as they leave their families every day to care for so many and sending us all love. Esther and Margie send their gratitude. 
Jackie says, we're connected in the web of all existence. Hi, Mariah, we're grateful to see you too. Linda Latham says she's grateful for greater connection with her family and friends via telephone. We're being able to have deeper, more meaningful conversations over the phone. Scott says the sun still rises, the birds still sing, the flowers still bloom. Nicole expresses love for her family and friends and you, you faith. Scott says, may our world approach this pandemic with kindness and compassion, helping each other with gratitude, acknowledging that we are all connected. Gary says, thank you all for doing your part to keep us all safe. Nicole suggests we take advantage of the downtime to be grateful for our families. Natalie says, grateful for my hands in the earth, yanking out the weeds ever so carefully in order to pull their very roots. Natalie, when you're done in your yard, you can come to mine. I'll bring you a cold drink and leave it on the porch. Rita says, we are stronger because of each other. Thank you to my great covenant group. You are the best. Diane is grateful. Does anyone else have something they would like to lift up now? Oh, Georgette, prayers for my daughter's mother-in-law who passed this week. Dolores, we will miss you. I'm sorry, Georgette. Elizabeth Hayes says, I'm compiling a list of the many ways we can stay socially connected while remaining socially distant. For you, you Miami will gladly share it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll share what we find too. It's one of the things that's cool is all over the world, our congregations, not just Unitarian Universalists, but denominations of all kinds, traditions of all kinds are capturing online live stream uh, web services and then posting them so we can kind of go to congregations anytime, anywhere and join in with people all over the world. Karen Pagano, we're going by me, looking forward to returning home, though the journey by car is a bit uncertain. We'll shelter in place upon my return to Cape Cod. I am so grateful that you're all here. You're an amazing congregation, and we are so glad to have you. Please be safe on your journey, Karen. If I make it to the Cape later this summer, we'll say hi. Lucy. Lucy Hardy, grief over my mom alone is definitely having an effect on me, but I'm so grateful for my sisters and children and congregation. Yes, Lucy, we've been thinking of you. Jorge Rodriguez, grateful for workers out there doing their jobs, putting themselves at, themselves at risk to keep people supplied and fed, grocery workers, delivery drivers, fast food workers, and so on. Oh, yes. Thank you, all those people doing the essential work that keeps this thing running. Ken and Leanna, thanks to all who put their heart and soul into this wonderful service. Wow, 97 participants. And that's even actually more participants because that's 97 windows. Some are more than one person. Thanks to be able to hear Kaya and other musicians online. That's cool. Hey, yes, nice to see Ava here. Ava's my granddaughter. She's, she's uh, tuned in from Switzerland. And Ava came back, happy to be in touch with everyone. Scott, so nice to see so many faces. It's a blessing. Our room license max is 100, and we have 97. Time to get a larger license. Ah, uh, see, we thought we had all the room in the world now. <laughs> River of Grass keeps busting at the edges, y'all. Janie, prayers for my flight attendant friends still flying people home and at risk every day. Oh, yes, absolutely. Karen Dixon, I missed coming to Florida this winter, but so glad I can join you in this way. Susan, kudos to Zena, Rebecca, Rev Amy, and all who made today's poetry service happen. Soul filling. Oh, I want you to know we did gather back in the building for the before we shut the doors for this interim however long it lasts, but we, we kept good distance. You'll see in the pictures that 
we used all that space with just a half a dozen of us in the room. Jody, I'm grateful for the technology that allows us to be together. Linda Latherm, amen to all who put the service together. Anybody else? We hold this space. Omar Pesa and Renato, thank you to everyone for putting together such a meaningful service. Your dedication is incredible. There is always hope in the horizon. We love you all and grateful for all of you. Us to you. Us to you. Ken and Leanna, prayers for the safety of our medical, professional, family members, Merritt and Heidi. Oh, yes, absolutely. Let's, oh, thank you for inviting those not, those without eventless. Oh, eventless, those eventless not in your congregation. Oh, <laughs> thank you for inviting those not in your congregation, always. And this is a way that, uh, that we can get together across many, many miles. So please let your friends know. They can join us at any time. We love and miss you all. The Hutton Corp, speaking of far flung, the Hutton Corps miss us. We're so grateful to be part of this. We're grateful to see you here too. Let's take a moment now to consider these things that have been lifted up. Hold these in our hearts. Deep breath, everybody. We lift these things, written and unwritten, chatted and unchatted, spoken and unspoken, asking that we be seers of hearts in new ways of seeing, even as we also allow our hearts to be seen Our world has tilted. We live in a vast unknown along with the known. Please, may we be brave enough and humble enough to hold these two things in ourselves and in our world and to hold these things for one another, knowing that on one moment we may call someone we love and say, I'm fine, and another we may call and say, I need you now. May we be ready to be the receivers and the senders of those calls. For all the helpers the world round who are trying to keep the world spinning in the ways that we have known, the workers, the medical professionals, the deliverers of mail, the grocery stores and the delivery persons and the drivers and Oh my goodness, there's just, we find out right now who the really essential people are who make this place go, who make our lives what they are. We're grateful that we have electricity and air conditioning if we need it, heat if we need it someplace else. We're grateful for one another as we realize in not being able to be together in the same space physically, we realize all the more how much we need one another spiritually. Guard our, guard our minds in this time of so many decisions to be made with not enough data to make some of those decisions. And we're also so grateful for those who keep the data coming to us in whatever ways they can. that We might make informed decisions how to care for one another, how to keep ourselves and each other safe how to be good stewards of this time and this place and this love and this hope and this faith that we're given. We lift all these things in the name of all that is holy. Amen and amen, amen. Aho, ashe, namaste, blessed be. And so it is.
Last Wednesday, week ago Wednesday, which seems like such a very long time ago now, someone passing by on our Facebook feed said the world needs more poetry right now. And Zena and our beloveds who love poetry at River of Grass certainly know this. And so this service that was planned for some time proves even more timely now. When that suggestion that we needed more poetry passed by on Facebook, one of my colleagues, who is herself a poet and minister to the Church of the Larger Fellowship, went and sat down at her desk in her kitchen, and she wrote a poem for us that has since traveled the world over. And she says, it's kind of funny that a poem about a virus has gone viral. Pandemic by the Reverend Lynn Unger. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, Touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down, and when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny that now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out those hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. We extinguish our chalices. But stay right here in this room as we have more. We extinguish this chalice flame, but not the fire that burns within, nor the light that leads us on. I'm going to get a fresh cup of coffee, and I hope you will too. And we're going to think about our parting in a way that, that is new, all of it's new right now to some degree. We will remember as we depart this time into a world that rattles with the unknown, the uncertain, the future that we cannot see. And the fact that we ever think we can, we now understand is always an illusion. All we have is right now. And all we know is that we can love one another and move forward together. Or better still, just hold still until we know more. So, we're going to go get our coffee. We're going to come back. We're going to chat. We're going to spend some more time with one another. We're going to keep envisioning this world transformed and know that we must transform to make it so. And all of these things mean so many different things now. Until we meet again, Shine on.